Good morning, everyone. You may be seated. Good morning. There we go. <laughs> good morning, everyone online. I always forget to say good morning to the people online. Good morning, everyone watching online. Happy New Year. Welcome to 2021. I was uh, thinking about making the dad joke that I haven't seen you since last year, but God, I just couldn't do it. I just, but I just did it. So anyway, consider that the dad joke for the message. That is officially the dad joke of the message. Turn in your Bibles to Colossians chapter 3. And while you are uh, turning to Colossians chapter 3, there are a couple of other places to mark in your Bibles. One is Matthew chapter 5, and the other is Galatians chapter 5. We'll be turning that to that Galatians passage right away, so keep that one um, at your fingertips. While you're turning, I'll just mention a couple of things to you. First of all, if, if you don't know me, if I've not had the chance to meet you yet, my name is Tracy Tucker. I'm one of the pastors here. And if I have not met you, I would love the opportunity to meet you before this day is, is done. Um, I was last up here, as I said, last week in September, and a lot of new people have come to our church since September of last year. So if I've not had the chance to meet you yet, I would love to be able to do that. Before you leave today, um, there's a couple of things that I, I like to preface uh, this message with, and, and one is that, you know, a lot of times I'll say, Paul says, or Peter says, or Paul wrote, um, and of course what I mean by that is, you know, the, the author of the scriptures is the Holy Spirit, and he moved on men to write uh, as he gave them inspiration, and that is, you know, the Bible says of itself that all scripture is given by inspiration of God, so when I say Paul wrote, or Peter said, or something like that, what I really mean is that the Holy Spirit said these things through the writer, through the apostles, and so I like to make that clear because I, I sort of um, I make that point when I'm, when I'm referring to uh, what they wrote along the way. Secondly, I wanted to say that this is, as I said last week, this is part two of a two-part study. Although as I got into this study, I realized that there are three parts to this study. And so I'm not going to keep you here for three hours today. You're glad to hear that. I know everyone is glad to hear that. Um, but there is a part three uh, that is verses 18 through the end of the chapter, and there's no way we're going to get through that today. I, I thought I could do it, but I should have known better. There's just too much material here. Um, before we jump into part two, this is part two. This is verses 12 through 17. This is the character of the new man itself. And in last week's message, we talked about setting the table. Paul set the table. Before he could get into the character of the new man, he said, there are some things that we need to get straight first. And so he set the table. This week is the meal. This is the character of the new man itself, where he describes in detail what those character attributes look like. So we're going to cover some of that today. And then um, previously in, yeah, I feel like the TV guy, previously in Colossians chapter 3, um, this is what we said. There are a few things to get straight. Number one, he said, change your perspective. From the temporal to the eternal. From our own perspective to the perspective of others. You know, human nature is to default to self-preservation. We start doing it when we're four years old. When you ask a four-year-old, did you make that mess? They say, nope, I didn't have anything to do with it. We default to self-preservation because that's human nature. The supernatural nature that we get from a relationship with a perfect and holy God where we've confessed our sins, we've asked Jesus Christ to be our Savior, we're indwelt by the Holy Spirit, that is a supernatural perspective that allows us to change from ourselves to others. And that changing of perspective is how we get through adversity, it's how we deal properly with each other, it's how we view the world. It becomes our worldview from an eternal perspective rather than a temporal perspective. So we covered that in some detail last time. Number two, Paul's point was believers, we're, we're not our own. We're bought with a price. We are not our own property anymore as if we were in the first place. But believers are no longer defined by who we were in the flesh, but by now who we are in Christ Jesus. Amen? That's what, um, that's what Paul wrote 
And our new identity should inspire us to discipline ourselves to be godly, not because we desire favor from the Lord. I'm not going, yeah, that's the, the difference between um, discipline and uh, legalism, right? Discipline, the disciplined heart says, I will do this thing because I, I love the Lord and I desire to please him. The legalist uh, heart says, I will do this thing to gain merit from God, and you should do the same thing because it will help you gain merit from God, and if you don't, you're in sin. That's legalism, right? Discipline is from a heart of love that says, I want to discipline myself to godliness because, the Lord, because I love the Lord and I desire to please him, and that is a very important distinction. And then number three, in the flesh, there were differences that divided us, Paul wrote. But in Christ, there are no such differences. Before we're saved, you know, as I've said before, when I did prison ministry, boy, those, those kids would look at me and say, what are you doing here? What do you have in common with me? And I would say to them that we are both equally separated from God by our sin and both equally in need of a Savior. That's what I have in common with you. And so that's why I was there. Um, but once we're saved, we have the same spiritual value. We are all of the same standing before God. Why? Because of the shed blood of Jesus Christ. There are no more differences in Christ. You know, we all have the same spiritual value. You know, Paul went into the list. There's neither slave nor free. There is neither in, in um, other places, he said, there is neither male nor female. There is neither Greek nor Jew. We all have the same standing before God because of the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And these differences that, that are between you are of your own making. You know, as I said, Paul, uh, Peter learned that lesson the hard way. And in Acts 10, 34, he said, God is no respecter of persons. So under what possible biblical grounds or moral grounds do we think we have to be respecters of persons? The answer is none. We are all of the same value, spiritual value, before God, we all have the same standing because of the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Amen? So those were the three points in the first chunk of this lesson. That is setting the table for, for the meal itself. And that brings us to our text. For today's study, Colossians chapter 3, starting in verse 12, reads, Therefore is the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, Bearing with one another and forgiving one another, if anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which you were also called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, in all wisdom, teaching, at admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs and singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for your word. First, as we, as we noted last time, Paul is addressing believers in this passage. He said, uh, if you call yourself a believer, if you are a believer in Christ, he said at the beginning of Colossians chapter 3, then Colossians chapter 3. If you're a believer, this is how your character should look. And if it doesn't look this way, you need to bring it into alignment with what the Scripture says. And here he says, therefore, as the elect of God. So he covered all those things in the first chunk, the first 11 verses. Now he says, therefore, since all those things are true, now this. This is what the character of the new man actually looks like. So... He says, therefore, as the elect of God. Now, the elect means those who are saved. I don't want us to get sidetracked by that term, the elect, because it's been debated for centuries, and we're not going to solve that debate here today, and that is not our purpose. The question always comes up, who are these so-called elect, and am I one of them? And, you know, we're not going to answer that question today. For our purposes, Paul says, as the elect of God, he means believers, people who are saved. Pastor Chuck used to, Pastor Chuck Smith, the founder of the Calvary Chapel movement, when someone would say, well, who are these elect? And do I know? Look, I just dropped my Apple pencil. We're going to put that right in there. Pretend that never happened. You never saw that. Uh, Pastor Chuck used to say, when somebody would say, uh, who are these elect? And am I one of them? He'd say, well, just get saved and find out. 
You know, that was his answer to that question. And I think that's a great answer. We're not going to solve that debate today. Um, so I don't want to dwell on it or divide over it. Suffice to say, for the purposes of this study, that Paul is talking to believers. He says in verse 12, Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, and long suffering. Now, where else in Scripture do we see a list like that? Well, there are several of them, as a matter of fact. The most familiar is probably in Galatians chapter 5. That's why I had you mark that if you have. Galatians chapter 5 marked. Uh, turn there now. We'll read a couple of these verses, starting in verse 19. Galatians chapter 5 says, Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath. That one's got a little footnote with my name next to it. Selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like. Of which I tell you beforehand, just as I told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. The Apostle Paul was the first Nuthetic counselor. You know what a Nuthetic counselor is. That's one who shines the light of God's word on whatever the problem is and says, here's the problem. Here's what God's word says. Are you in alignment with what God's word says? Yes or no? If not, why not? And how do we get you from being out of alignment with the scriptures to being in alignment with the scriptures? And that's how a Nuthetic counselor attacks problems. Paul was the first Nuthetic counselor. He said, this is the flesh list. This is the spirit list. Does your life look like the flesh list or the spirit list? Which one? And if it looks more like the flesh list, why then there's a problem. And we need to deal with that problem. So what do we do? What do we do? If you claim to be a believer, your life should look more like the, the spiritual list, the fruit of the spirit. You should be bearing the fruit of the spirit rather than the works of the flesh. So what is the solution? We well, answered that question back in verse 16 in Galatians chapter 5. He said, I say then, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh, right? In other words, if you're walking with the spirit and you're reacting to things from the spirit rather than your flesh, then you won't be plagued by life besetting outbursts of wrath or, or works of the flesh. You will bear the fruit of the spirit because you're walking in the spirit. Make sense? So Paul was the very first Nuthetic counselor, and he said in verses 24 uh, through 26 of Galatians chapter 5, and those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. And as we said last week, if we're behaving that way, it's because we're walking in the flesh rather than in the Spirit. We have a uh, temporal perspective, right? This changing of our perspective to the eternal helps us deal with other people in a better way because we're thinking, putting others ahead of ourselves, giving preference to one another rather than viewing the world from our own perspective and only our own perspective. I want what I want. I don't care what anyone else wants or needs. That's not the way we're told to live. That's not in keeping with the character of the new man. Paul said, let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. All of those things are self-centered, self-worshipping attributes. They should not define the character of the new man. So getting back to Colossians chapter 3, verse 12, what does Paul say to do? In verse 12, he says, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering. He says, put on these things as if you're putting on a garment. Do you remember uh, Peter writing something similar to that? You know, I saw it quoted this week uh, where Peter says, cast your cares on him for he cares for you. But before that, he said, be clothed in humility. Put humility on like a garment. Wear it so that other people can see it. Clothe yourself in humility. This imagery is important because it serves to remind us that these character attributes should cover us and envelop us and be visible from a distance. 
never mind up close. When people look at us, they can see, hopefully, that we're wearing clothes. <laughs> hopefully, most of the time, unless you watch TV, in which case, I don't recommend that you watch TV. Or, you know, some of these um, companies like, um, I forget which one it was, maybe American Eagle or something like that, you walk into their store and they've got pictures of people barely wearing clothes. And I'm going, there's a gap in the logic here, okay? Your company is a clothing company, and yet your models are not wearing any clothes. Do you see the gap in the logic there? So, <clears throat> these character attributes, writes the Holy Spirit, through both Peter and Paul, should be just as obvious as the physical clothes that we are wearing. They should be visible both up close and from a distance. They should define our character. They should define who we are. And in, in this way, these character attributes mark the lives of the new man, the follower of Christ. In verse 13, Paul shifts the topic then to forgiveness. Colossians chapter 3, verse 13. Bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you must also do. Wow. Did you hear that? Even as Christ forgave you, so you must also do. That's a pretty high standard. How did Christ forgive us? In Romans chapter 5, verse 8, Paul wrote to the church at Rome, but God demonstrates his own love toward us then in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. What does that mean? Let's pause here and take this in for a minute. What does that mean? That means that the Lord Jesus, who was totally innocent of any sin whatsoever, took a savage beating, a punishment on our behalf that we deserved. He took on our behalf. After he was beaten to a pulp, his beard was pulled out by the roots. Any of you guys who have beards, if you just pull on that thing a little bit, you realize how much that hurts? They pulled his beard out by the roots, pulled it off of his face. And then they mockingly put a crown of thorns, jammed it into his scalp. And then he was made to carry his cross until he fell to the ground under the weight of it. And then... After they got to the place where they were going to crucify him, he was nailed to that cross. Nailed to that cross. Can you imagine having your flesh nailed to a cross? I'm sorry to be graphic, but we need to understand what the Lord went through on our behalf. We don't just need to blow by those words in the scripture or think about them only on Easter, right? Think about what the Lord went through on our behalf. He endured that so that he didn't have to. And the very people who spat on him and mocked him and said, if you're the Christ, take yourself down off of that cross. What did he say? He said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. He did this for us, knowing full well the despicable sins that we would commit in our lifetime. He knew what we would do, and he was willing to do it anyway. That's how he loved us. That's how he forgave us. So getting back to what Paul said, even as Christ forgave you, so you must also do. That's a high standard. Does it sound like it has a limit to it? Doesn't sound like that to me. But we do. We have that limit, right? We all have a grace limit. When you, when you get to your grace limit with me, that's it. When you reach that grace limit, no more grace for you. That's it. We all have a grace limit. I'll forgive you up to a certain point, but boy, there's a line that you better not cross. And once you cross that line, no more grace for you. But that's not what the scripture says. Even as Christ forgave you, so you must also do. Peter asked Jesus about this very topic. Matthew records the exchange 
between Peter and Jesus, almost as if he's telling on Peter. It's hilarious that, that Matthew wrote this. You say, oh, you should have seen what Peter did. Check this out. Um, but, but Peter asked Jesus about this. In Matthew 18 is where this is all covered. Peter came to the Lord and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? What did Jesus say? He said, nope. I do not say to you up to seven times, but 70 times seven. In effect, as many times as it takes. As many times as your brother sins against you. That's how often you're supposed to forgive him. Jesus went on to teach then, Matthew records, the parable of the unforgiving servant. And in that servant, I'm sorry, in that parable, uh, a servant uh, owes a debt that he cannot pay. And so he goes and asks for mercy. And he's given that mercy. Yet the people that owe him money, he is not willing to forgive. And that costs him very dearly. In fact, Jesus said in verse 35 of Matthew chapter 18, So my heavenly Father also will do to you if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. So that becomes important reinforcement of Paul's point. If we don't forgive, we shouldn't expect to be forgiven. Amen? Jesus even said it in his model prayer, Matthew 6, verse 12. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors because that's all the forgiveness we can ask for without hypocrisy as much as we're willing to give. So I ask you again, after the debt that Jesus paid for us, does it sound like he has a grace limit? The answer is no, at least not on this side of eternity. Now, Jesus did say that in Matthew 12, 31, every sin will be forgiven except blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. But this has in view dying unsaved. If you die unsaved, there is no more hope. That's it. It is appointed once for a man to die and then judgment. So if you die, if you blaspheme the, the ministry of the Holy Spirit and you die unsaved, you will reap the, the, the consequences of that free choice. But this side of eternity, meaning before we die, he says, seek him while he may be found. Better to know him as Savior than to face him as judge. Amen? Seek him while he may be found. Jesus doesn't have a grace limit. So what did Paul mean when he said, even as Christ forgave you, so you must also do? Does that sound like it has a limit? No, it does not. So what do we do? If we've reached our grace limit with someone, what do we do? Well, Paul gives us the guidance. We bear with one another. We forgive one another. We look beyond faults. We see their needs. We offer forgiveness, and we seek reconciliation. In fact, Jesus said we should be reconciled to our brother even before we think about worship. Think about that for a minute. Turn to the other place that I ask you to mark in Matthew chapter 5. In Matthew chapter 5, starting in verse 1, it says, You have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not murder, and whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment. But I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother without cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever says to his brother Raka shall be in danger of the council. But whoever says you fool shall be in danger of hell fire. Verse 23, therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift before the altar and go your way. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Agree with your adversary quickly while you are on the way with him, lest your adversary deliver you to the judge and the judge hand you over to the officer and you be thrown into prison. Assuredly, I say to you, you will by no means get out of there until you have paid every last penny. So be reconciled to your brother before you even come here to worship. Well, you say, well, what if my brother doesn't want to be reconciled? Okay. That's possible, but you can't be the problem. We can't be the problem. I can't be the thing that keeps me from reconciling with my brother. Romans chapter 12, verse 18 says, If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. 
Well, not everything depends on me. Sometimes people don't want to reconcile. But my unwillingness to reconcile cannot be the thing that keeps me from reconciliation. Amen? Is it always possible? No. But as much as it is possible, and as much as it depends on me, I've been given the ministry of reconciliation. So if two people are at odds, I as a believer have been given the, recon- the ministry of reconciliation. Only one of us needs that. It's great if we both have it, but only one of us needs it. It's my responsibility to seek reconciliation with my brother because I have been given a ministry. Every believer has been given the ministry of reconciliation. Amen? So when we go and deal with other people, we need to keep in mind that our, our perspective is eternal, not temporal. We need to put their needs ahead of our own, and we need to understand that we have been given a ministry of reconciliation, and it is our responsibility to make peace. The Bible doesn't say, blessed are the peace lovers. It says, blessed are the peace makers. That is our responsibility. That is the character of the new man. Does that make sense? Okay, let's keep going. We should not invoke a grace limit as if it is our place to define how much grace someone gets. That place is only rightfully occupied by God. So if we have reached our grace limit, what should we do? We should ask the Lord to empty us of ourselves, fill us with a supernatural capacity for grace, and then fill that grace from his reservoir so that it overflows in us, so that we can show it to other people. Are there circumstances where tough love is necessary? Sure there are. Paul wrote in Romans chapter 1 that there were those who were given over to a debased mind to reap the consequences of their sin. Sin has far-reaching consequences. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul wrote of people who had become so immoral that they had to be given over to Satan for the destruction of their flesh so that their souls may be saved. Now that's someone who has clearly chosen their sin over repentance and reconciliation. If after the biblical process is followed and the person chooses their sin over repentance and reconciliation, well, sometimes they have to reap what they sow. But that's not our place to determine. That's the Lord's place. We're to follow the prescription of discipline and reconciliation. We're to follow that. But we don't control what the other person does. And if the other person does not want to reconcile, well, at some point, if they choose their sin over reconciliation, they will reap what they have sown. But we can't be the problem. Okay, so what's next? Look at verse 14, back in Colossians chapter 3. It says, But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of of perfection. Now, we've talked a lot about the consequences of unforgiveness, but more importantly, Paul says, we should forgive one another out of love. All the gifts and all the good works in the world are worthless if they are done without love. Amen? Pretty much all of 1 Corinthians chapter 13 is about that very thing. That's why you hear it read at weddings all the time. Love never fails. You can't defend love. Now abide faith, hope, love, but the greatest of these is love. Now that's interesting. Faith, hope, love, but the greatest of these is love. Why is that interesting? Because... In Hebrews, it says that without faith, it's impossible to please God. But here, the Holy Spirit says love is greater than faith. Isn't that interesting? That's why it's called the bond of perfection. And we would do well to remember that. Love covers a multitude of sins. One reason Paul links these two attributes is because of verses 13 and 14. We have to do these things because we love one another. It is the bond of perfection. God is love, and so we're to imitate that behavior. That's the character of the new man. Look at verse 15 in Colossians chapter 3. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which you were also called in one body, and be thankful. The heart of the new man should be ruled by peace rather than turmoil. The peace that surpasses all understanding. Peace in the middle of chaos. 
peace in the middle of crisis. That should be what rules the heart of the new man, not turmoil, not the chaos. Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7, Paul writes, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. The new man should be anxious for nothing. Why is that? Because the new man has things in proper perspective, eternal rather than temporal. And a result, as a result of that new perspective, that proper perspective, he takes everything to the Lord in prayer. Everything to the Lord in prayer. In prayer, not as the last step, not as an act of desperation. Well, I guess all there is left to do now is pray. Have you heard people say that? That's not the character of the new man. The new man is full of peace because he takes everything to God in prayer as his first step, not his last step. It's not his last resort. It's his first act of obedience. God is in control. Romans 8.31 says, What shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? And Proverbs 11.12 says, He who is devoid of wisdom despises his neighbor, but a man of understanding holds his peace. The heart, the character of the new man should be defined by peace, not by turmoil. And Proverbs 19.11, You knew it was only a matter of time before I quoted Proverbs 19.11. It's my favorite verse. The discretion of a man makes him slow to anger, and his glory is to overlook a transgression. So Paul reminds us in verse 15 of of Colossians chapter 3 that we are called to this peaceful state. And this call is common to all believers. We are all one body sharing the same call to peace. He closes verse 15 almost as an add-on, and he says, and be thankful. Now, The phrase, with thanksgiving, appears 43 times in the New King James Version. And not surprisingly, many of these are in the Psalms, and also not surprisingly, many of them are paired with prayer, prayer and thanksgiving. When we come to the Lord in prayer, we need to remember to approach him with reverence and thanksgiving. We don't just show up and start bossing him around. We need to approach him with reverence, and with thanksgiving. And so what guidance does Paul give us next? Back in Colossians chapter 3, verse 16. He says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another, in psalms, in hymns, in spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. What does that mean, to let the word dwell in you richly? Well, the imagery that always comes to my mind when I think of letting the word dwell in me richly is when you marinate something before you cook it, right? What's the purpose of marination? It's to take whatever you're cooking and saturate it with herbs and spices and flavor so that it will take on those things, those attributes of the marinade when it faces the heat. Boy, if that is not the perfect sermon illustration, I don't know what is. <clears throat> when we let the, the God's word dwell in us richly, we are steeped in God's word, allowing it to soak in, and we absorb the flavor of it. Our hearts and minds begin to take on the flavor of what we marinate ourselves in. And whether it's The news or social media or God's word, whatever you marinate your heart and mind in is the flavor you are going to take on. Amen? And just like when marinated meat is cooked, meaning it faces heat, it tastes like the marinade. It comes out of the fire better than it would have had it not been marinated. The same is true of us. If we soak in the marinade of God's word and we steep our hearts and minds in God's word, we are more prepared to face the heat, the trials of adversity that come our way than if we were not soaked 
in God's word, if we did not let God's word dwell in us richly. Amen? You know, just like the marinade has a, a curing effect on the meat when it faces the heat, so does God's word have a curing effect on our hearts and minds when we face adversity. James said, my brothers, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Why? Because this is the opportunity to demonstrate the character that the new man is supposed to have in the first place. You, you spend all this time practicing, then it's game time. When adversity comes, okay, here we go. Here's some adversity. Let's bring to bear those character attributes that we have been steeping our hearts and minds in, that we have prepared ourselves for when the adversity comes. When this happens in the life of the believer, it allows us to better respond to adversity from the spirit rather than our flesh. How does this happen? How does it happen? Well, the Holy Spirit is able to call to mind the right precept when we're walking with him, when we know God's word. There's a deep reservoir from which he can draw if we have spent our time letting the word of God dwell in us richly. This not uh, notion of, of abiding in the truth. 1 John 2, 24 and 25 says, Therefore... Let that abide in you which you heard from the beginning, that if you heard from the beginning abides in you, you will also abide in the Son and in the Father. So how do we abide in this truth? We come before the Lord in prayer with the appropriate reverence and thanksgiving. We seek him in his word, and then we listen to what he has to say to us because we seek him. In his word, that's where he talks to us. That's where he reveals himself to us. And then we pick up our cross daily and we follow him. And when these things happen in the course of our day, we yield to the spirit to shape our response to things rather than the knee-jerk reaction from our flesh. That is the character of the new man. It's more likely when we're walking closely with the spirit and not in our flesh. And we have things in what did I say earlier? Proper perspective. This is the practical application of literally everything Paul has said in Colossians chapter 3. And the rest of verse 16 reads, Teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in our hearts to the Lord. Why, that's what we're doing here today. We're singing songs and admonishing one another, that is, unless you're sitting next to me, in which case you're not being admonished, in which case your hearing might be damaged. <laughs> but we're teaching. We're, we're opening God's word. We're admonishing one another. We're singing psalms and hymns. Just as we're told in Isaiah uh, 28, line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. We open the word. We go through it line by line. We join together in corporate worship and singing and praises to God. This is both pleasing to God and edifying to one another. Psalm 22.3 says God inhabits the praises of his people, and that's not just singing worship songs at church. That can be praying with a friend. That can be giving. That can be um, answering God's call on your life. It can be any act of worship. God is able to move through those things and work powerfully in those acts of worship. That's why we're told in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 and 25, and let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, in, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching, as we see the end of the world coming, unfolding before our very eyes, it is more important than ever for us to gather together and to worship the Lord together and to edify one another and to study his word so that we know how to respond to these things when they unfold before us. And then lastly, in verse 17, Paul closes with this guidance. In, in verse 17, he says, And whatever you do, in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Je Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So every word and every deed we do should be in the name of the Lord Jesus. Everything. <laughs> One of the things Richard and I always say is that our friendship 
is based on a common call to serve God here in this place at this time, doing this thing. We're both called here. If it weren't for that, he and I would probably not even be friends at all. It is almost comical how different Richard Priya and I are. He's a little bit country. I'm a little bit rock and roll, right? And it is, a, it is, it is humorous how different he and I are. But when it comes to serving God's call in our lives and to rightfully dividing the word of truth and to serving all of you, we are in lockstep, Richard and I. And he is my brother. And there are very few friends that I have had in my life as close to me as Richard Perea. In spite of the fact that we are so different. We are an odd couple. Richard Perea and Tracy Tucker are an odd pairing. Which proves to me that the Lord has a sense of humor. But everything that we do, everything that, you know, everything that we do <clears throat> is an answer to God's call on our lives. And, and our friendship is, is a result of that, is a byproduct of that service, that answering of God's call. We serve together in the name of the Lord Jesus. This principle will also help us declutter our lives. Under perfect conditions, we should analyze everything we do and ask, am I doing this in the name of the Lord or not? And if not, why not? Is it dishonoring or sinful? Well, then don't do it. Is it frivolous? Is it a waste of time? Well, then don't do it. Always know your why. I like for things to have a why. And there's a good friend of mine who says, always know your why and never lose sight of it. And one more phrase in verse 17 that I want to just touch on really quick before we go is it says, giving thanks to the Father through him. And it's because of this verse and others like it that we pray to the Father in the name of the Son by the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay, so clearly we are not going to get through the end of the chapter in this study, and there will be a part three. I don't know when that part three will be taught, but, you know, we'll see how 2021 goes. But um, let's just summarize what we've studied here in verses 12 through 17. Paul says the character of the new man should be marked by the following one, tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering. In other words, the fruit of the Spirit rather than the works of the flesh. Number two, the willingness to look beyond faults, see needs, and forgive. The new man puts the needs of others ahead of his own. Once the new man reaches his grace limit, he asks the Lord for the ability to extend more grace. Even as Christ forgave us, so we must also do. And that's a very high standard. Number three, it should be marked by love, the bond of perfection. This should be the motivation behind everything that we do. It's what drove Jesus to the cross to pay a debt that we could never afford. He loved us. We love him because he first loved us. And he died for us while we were yet sinners, knowing full well the sins that we would commit. And he was willing to die for us anyway. That's a very high standard. And it should affect how we deal with one another. Number four is peace. The new man's heart should be ruled by peace and not by turmoil. Number five, it should be spent in time. Number five, time should be spent in God's word, seeking him in his word to hear what he has to say to us because that's where he reveals himself to us. And lastly, number six, acting as unto the Father in the name of the Son by the power of the Holy Spirit. Always know your why. And never lose sight of it. So there you go. The character of the new man. Let's pray together. We're about to take.